A true comic and film legend joins us in a World Over exclusive. Geronimo! Jerry Lewis is here to talk about his eight-decade career, his beloved partnership with Dean Martin, and he finally tells why he dedicated so much of his life to the Muscular Dystrophy Association and much more. The legendary Jerry Lewis is here for the entire hour on this very special edition of The World Over, starting right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you in the United States and the world over. My guest tonight is truly a legend, an Oscar winner, a groundbreaking filmmaker, and a cultural icon, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. He's been hailed as one of America's great comic actors. His career began over 80 years ago, at the age of five, and he hasn't stopped working since. The man is still booking dates. From his early days in vaudeville, through his 10-year partnership with Dean Martin, to his film career as a director, writer, and actor, Jerry Lewis discusses it all tonight in a candid and at times hilarious interview. For the first time, he also discusses his decades-long association with the Muscular Dystrophy Association, for whom he raised billions of dollars. For years, Lewis has avoided questions about why he continued to do the MDA telephone for so long and what first drew him to it. Tonight, he sets the record straight and reveals new details for the first time. He talks about his triumphs, his legacy, and even his great regrets. I will confess up front, I've wanted to interview Jerry Lewis for a long time, and I'm very excited to share this unflinchingly honest, wistful interview with you. I spoke with Jerry in Las Vegas. I even got to see the Oscar and clown around a bit. Remarkably, Mr. Lewis is nearly 90 years old. Not that you'd know it. Here's my exclusive interview with the indomitable Jerry Lewis. I want to start. Oh, my God. This is what happens every time I do an interview. Thank you. Tell me about Danny and Ray, your parents. I want to know what you took from them. They were vaudevillians. They were in burlesque. Oh. At five, they put you on the stage. My dad was my teacher. Every time he'd go on stage, I learned something else. He was the epitome of magnificence on the stage. Mm. He did everything. He was the funniest man I ever saw in my life. When he put a hat on and he wanted to make you laugh, he made you laugh. That same funny man became this handsome romantic singer, and then he would do a sketch with a, a couple of other people, and you'd watch him get that audience hysterical. Hmm. How often did you travel with them? Not, not terribly often. At the beginning, I was, uh, I guess, eight or nine when they moved out a lot, hmm. and I stayed with my grandma. I, I want to read something you said uh, in an interview. You said, the audience is nothing more then 800 or 900 mamas and papas clapping their hands and saying, good boy, good boy, baby. Right. Do you need that? Do you crave that? Oh, God, yes. Support from an audience? Uh, yeah, well, Sam, my gorgeous wife, can verify there are times when I get a little unnerved by the world and she'll say, you got to go and perform because that's the time that she sees me needing it. Mm. And then I'll book concerts and I'll work maybe two, three weeks to do three or four concerts. And I get rejuvenated, my batteries get charged, mm. and then I'm good for a couple of months. In your memoir, though, and this is what is so curious about you as a performer, as a man, you describe yourself as a dummy, a misfit, the, the sorriest kid alive. Yet you and Irving Kay, who's your guardian, at 16 years of age, you go out on the road. You're oh, performing. Yeah. How is that the sorriest dummy misfit? Did that? The character. 
That was the character. The character. But behind that character was a very smart, intelligent, erudite, very, very clearly thinking individual. A lonely individual? Lonely? No, on stage, yeah. Hmm. The loneliness of being a single performer can get to you unless you keep the rhythm going. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In 1946, you ended that loneliness big time. Yeah. You're at Atlantic City, you're at the 500 Club, and you call a singer that you only met once or twice, Italian singer, Dean Martin. What made that act work from that first night, and how choreographed was it? How much planning did you all do before you went out the first time? None. No planning. We both went out on stage and looked to save our lives because if we didn't do a show at midnight that night, we'd have been wearing cement shoes. I'm <laughs> quoting Skinny D'Amato. Oh, you, you'll have cement shoes unless you get a show on. And, and we did, Dean as a single performer would do four songs, it's 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. I did an act that ran 13 minutes because I did a dumb act to recordings. Pantomime. Between Dean and I, we didn't even do a half hour. So the boys came backstage after the show and said, uh, Jerry, you said that you two would do some funny things together. That's why we brought him in. Oh, when are you gonna do that? I said, we, we never do it the first show. We plan <laughs> everything after the first show. And I'm writing on a piece of rye bread paper that the sandwiches came in, and I'm writing a rundown of ideas that I took from my dad, from burlesque, from every show I ever saw, and we did two hours and 20 minutes, mm. not knowing what we were doing. The minds locked together, unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. Huh. My mind locked into his, his locked into mine, and we worked that first night no differently than we did the 10th year. I don't want no milk. I thought it was time for your bill. Shut your mouth, you drunk. I won't. <laughs> I'll report you to your father. You, yeah. gotta, you gotta drink milk. I don't want no milk. Rocky, you see that he takes his milk. I'm with you. Yeah. Get out. Wait in the car. <laughs> All right, you're gonna get your milk. No, Rocky, not that, Rocky. Yeah. Uh, Rock, give me a break, Rocky. No, you're gonna get it. Oh, Rocky, give me a break, Rocky. Hey. <laughs> It is a mad, antic marriage of two performers, and you'd never, you didn't know where it was going. No, they didn't either. And it was predicated, you would say, on love. Oh, it was all love, yeah. In what way? It was also a, a, a good place to get money to eat. <laughs> Not a bad motive. But we had a love affair from the moment we met, and we thought that was going to be a wonderful friendship. Jerry, looking at it, it looks like it's improvised and it's happening in real time, and you are making this up off the top of your head. When I read your book, when you read Dean and Me, you realize you were shaping this a lot more than what the audience could see. I was stunned to learn you all were the same height. How did you account and adjust that for the visual, to create an impression, an illusion for the audience that you wanted. I got his shoes and put a quarter of an inch heel on him so he'd be that much taller than me, because we were both six feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I needed him to stay straight, including the shoes, because the shoes gave us what I needed to have the audience see, which was like mm -hmm. this. I know that I sat with Dean and I said, what we have to do is to do nothing. Nothing. Meaning, let's take what we have settled on, stay with it, and make it the formula for everything else we do. 
and Dean had a tremendous understanding of where my brains came from. Mm. He didn't understand what a tree was. Well, if you're in Shobans long enough, you know you're going to walk into a tree backstage. <laughs> <clears throat> he didn't know what a pin spot was. Mm. And by the time we finished in Atlantic City, he knew my brain better than I did. And we had only had six or seven weeks together, but now we are on Broadway at the Capitol Theater getting $7,000 a week. The highest paid performers on Broadway, on television, film, I mean... Not at the beginning. No, but eventually. Well, oh, God, yes. Was he the father figure? Who? Dean. That Dean? you needed personally? He, he was a brother figure first, mm -hmm. then a father figure and a friend figure. Yeah. More than anything, a friend figure. I was always quoting from things that I read about friendship. And when it came to his birthday, I tore the page out in the dictionary under love, blew it up, put his picture next to it, and gave it to him for a birthday present. And he, he, he loved that photograph. And the, in signature, and the signature on it. And w whenever we went, that would come out of his case and put it up in his room. Um, he said thank you about a year later. <laughs> he was very slow. <laughs> yeah. Communication yeah. was not his gift, one-on-one, -on -one, bearing his soul. I never all. liked to interrupt his nap. <laughs> his nap went from Monday through Thursday. <laughs> but not when you were working? No. Went off when you hit the stage. Right. Which of the films, you all did all these great films, some not so great in your own estimation, which of them capture the essence of the act, if you had to say which of them? Well, if you look at, if you look at uh, my friend Irma or Irma Goes West, you can see the nucleus of the act being performed visually as well as verbally. And I worked with the writers very closely. And what we had was two people that were in love with what we did for one another on the stage. Mm -hmm. The fact that I loved him that much off the stage and as he did with me was the, was the foundation of everything we did. Yeah. I mean, there were times when I caught myself watching him and forgetting a cue because I was inspired <laughs> by what he, what he did. And he had the same problem. Mm. He said, you made me laugh so much that show when you did that thing with the hat. I said, well, I won't do it. He said, no, do it. <laughs> that was great. It's working. And we took from one show to another. We ah. did things in this show we had never done before. So I had a secretary sitting in the audience writing the rundown of what we did. And there was three new pieces in that show that I put in that show. In the following show. And then we would follow it up and continue there. People never time a laugh. And that was the mistake that most comics made. Mm. I was always with a stopwatch. I had to know how long that took. I knew how to fix it. I knew how to dump it.
almost tossed this off casually. He didn't want to think about it too much. Jerry Lewis was obsessive about every detail. And Dean called this your chaplain crap. It irritated him. Was that the, was that the source of the rupture that would break this team up? No. What was it? It was that we both had to do more. And the team was limiting. Dean was very limited. So was I. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm working with him and I'm thinking how that would work as a single, mm -hmm. which never entered my mind, but maybe once or twice in the whole time we were together. What we had was so deeply ingrained in both of us by the time we were together a year. I used to think if I pulled his skin out this far, you'd see me under there. <laughs> Yet you say when you break up, 1956, you get a group of reporters July together. July 25th, 1956. That's the date. Ten years to the day. You do your act at the Copa, and then you talk to reporters and you say, for the first time in ten years, I am rid of a cancer. Is that how you really felt at the time? I don't remember that quote. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't even sound like anything I would yeah. say. Were you hurt when Sinatra embraced and brought Dean into what would become the Rat Pack? Mm -hmm. Because he knew you as well. He performed with you. You, you. you were also a friend. Yet it seemed he chose Dean over you. What happened was that Frank protected Dean in a time when he needed it. He had such a, an affection for Dean. It was so wonderful because I had a thousand friends and you go up to Dean's suite and he's sitting with a valet, that's it. That's who he spent time with. And he wasn't envious of what I was doing. Why did that chemistry work with Dean in that Rat Pack setting? Was he playing you a bit? Nah. No, he, he was the he was the he was the comedian in that. No group question there. about it. And the timing, there are moments where he's interrupting himself in the song, which is what you used to do to him. He'd bump into the thing. In fact, they're recordings. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah. He bumps yeah. into the chair. Oh, sorry, Jerry. Uh, he's got you with him even after you broke up. So same way, with, same with me. How so? I would do things hoping he would appreciate it. I would do things. He's not even there. But if he saw it, and if he heard about it, I just wanted him to appreciate it, mm -hmm. that I didn't take down our reputation in any way. After the breakup, you do The Delicate Delinquent, mm -hmm. Cinderfella, mm -hmm. and then you go to direct a semi-silent movie, The Bellboy. What was silent about the movie? Semi-silent. Your, your character doesn't talk. That doesn't mean semi-silent. Well, That's... when your lead player is not talking. I got enough sound in that movie to disrupt <laughs> the hurricane. <laughs> I want to move on to your directing, because it is a very different Jerry we see. Oh, yeah. Tell me about The Nutty Professor and why Julius Kelp and Buddy Love have endured all this time later, more than 50 years. My children are watching this movie with their friends. Well, then you're telling me that the writer did something right. No, I think the actor and director did something right, and the writer, yeah. everybody. The Nutty Professor for me was a miracle thrown in my path huh. up here because the mental consideration of the material was never quite on the mark until it came from here. 
and that was all within me. In The Nutty Professor, yeah. you have two sides of this man. You have Kelp and your buddy Love. Right. Do they reflect the two sides of Jerry Lewis in some way? Oh, sure. I wrote it. Is that why it's so lively today? Where did I come up with that? From what I had. I was writing about what I had done. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a critique of what I had done and brought to Dean to learn. I suspect it was somewhat heavier than I had. Uh... Jerry, when you're talking about what you did, particularly the characters you played, yeah. you often refer to that person as... The idiot. The idiot, the kid, or Jerry. Yeah. Why do you do that? Because Jerry is the same age as the idiot. <laughs> but, the, but Joseph Levitch isn't. No, Joseph Levitch just sits in the dressing room, mm. waits for me to come back and find out how the show went. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the kid is the one, is the kid still the one who goes out when you perform? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's always there. He's the reason I'm alive, the kid. Hmm. The silliness of the kid built tremendously important, serious work. Hmm. The silliness of the kid created great work. The Dean loved the kid, the there. You don't need this and very often he would question my veracity on stage. When did we do that? I said, we'll do it, we'll talk about it later. I mean, that kind of stuff happened all the time. Now, the audience thinks we're doing something funny. We weren't doing anything funny. You were just talking. But because we were there, it was funny. I've got to talk to you, in, in our house, one of the beloved Jerry Lewis movies is Who's Minding the Store? which I think is one of the most underappreciated movies. You have such classic visual comedy in that movie from your classic typewriter scene, which you still do. that amazing vacuum cleaner <laughs> moment. Where did those moments come from? Frank, Frank Tashlin. Who's your, who's your writer? He was my writer-director. And I brought very little to that movie. Really? Because I didn't like the script. I didn't like the movie. And when it was finished, I hated it. Really? Yeah. But that's because I didn't satisfy me. I can do stuff by demand. I can pull something out of here that I don't necessarily enjoy doing, but I guarantee you it'll get a laugh. Mm. And I draw on that stuff very often. But I'm also very, very discriminating about what I put in the show because I haven't passed on it yet. Mm -hmm. And until I do, and that's the difference between Jerry and Jerry. I have to argue with Jerry the writer because I don't agree with him. And I separated the, the two completely. Because mm -hmm. I would go into the bathroom, close the door, look in the mirror, and tell him how wrong he is. I need to t ask you about Charlie Chaplin. Well, then you're going to need to reload and put more lights up because it'll take three hours to talk about Chaplin. The Reader's Digest of Chaplin. You loved him. You met him a number of times. What were you so drawn to and what did you learn from him? I never thought I would ever be in the presence of genius. I heard the word. It was used on me and I didn't understand it. But Charlie, you got probably a thousand performers today that learned from Charlie, whether they know it or not, that's something else. But I went to live with Charlie for two weeks at his home in Switzerland. And leaving there, I felt I had been at the, Brys, at, at the Brandeis Institute or ITT, Harvard or Yale, wow. is what I thought I had come away with. 
best two weeks of my life based on creativity. He obsessively edited, re-edited his own films. Oh, yeah. Do you do the same? Sure. Even now? Yeah. Why, Jerry? Because I know it better than an editor. And to communicate what you want to another person, you've already taken 3% of the idea and tossed it away. Mm -hmm. The minute you communicate your idea, 3% of it is worth throwing away. Hmm. When I look at your films, when I look at the body of work, I see a lot of Buster Keaton as much as Charlie Chaplin. Do well, you that's see a, that? That's a great compliment because Keaton was, he was a genius mind. He really was. And he did some physical stuff that I wish I did. You did a lot of it. There was a boldness and an inventiveness about him that I see in your work. Because he did to an audience what we did to an audience. Threw stuff at them hoping, hoping it'll work. You created Video Assist. Right. Because, out of necessity, I guess. Where did that come from? When did it come? In uh, 1953, I flew to Japan to talk to Sony Corporation because the, the son of Mr. Morita, mm -hmm. chairman of the board of Sony, the son is Ichi. Ichi is a, uh, a gorgeous 40-year-old, love the biggest fan I ever saw in my life. And he was assigned to take me through the technical aspect of Sony to see what I can take from it. Right. Marita didn't even know what my idea was, but I did tell him what I needed. Uh -huh. I left there after six weeks and I was ready to try the video assist. As a matter of fact, Sony Corporation gave me the V, we call it the V-tube. They gave me the V-tube that I later used in my video assist, which I still use. I still have it. And we should tell people at the time, everything was shot on film. This allowed you to video record whatever image you were capturing and watch it in real time. Right. Something that is used on every television show, every film in the world today. Because every comic has to ask someone over there, how was it? I didn't need to do that. I would just hit the button and see how it was, mm -hmm. and I print it from there, or go back and do it again. Uh -huh. I want to fast forward to, uh, really go back to MDA, Muscular Dystrophy Association. You and Dean did really one of the first telethons at Carnegie, Carnegie Hall, Hall, right, live in New York. Oh, yeah, and then years later, you take this on, this incredible, broadcast. 45 years, you raised $2.6 billion. 61 years. Total. 2 billion, 500,000. Why did you do it for so long, Jerry? Because I kept getting the money. What was the first impetus? Why devote so much of your time at the beginning to muscular dystrophy? Because I had to get the country to know about it. Was it someone you met who had muscular dystrophy? There's so many stories about the origins of your involvement in MDA. What was it? The truth of the matter was that I was shocked at how successful we were with the first one. Mm -hmm. Then the second, then the third, then the fourth got me, and mm -hmm. the fifth said to me, you got to do this a lot. Mm -hmm. To raise two billion five, who's going to do that? I mean, ever again. Probably. I could give them all of the tricks and all of the magic and all of the miracles of it, and he still couldn't pull it off. No. I, I was lucky. Well, you weren't lucky. You fell in love, I think, with those children. That's why they became oh, Jerry's kids. Of course. And the same love that you, the same manic, obsessive, mad, hilarious love that you and Dean generated, I would argue you brought to that MDA telethon. Oh, and yeah. for us, yeah. All of us watching, it was... I brought all of my equipment. Yeah. And I wondered if on that show, did I do it all? Or on the next show, will I continue to do it? I love that moment. You show this in your act, the Valley of Deers, that group, the barbershop The Valley group. Airs? Val Valley Airs. And to stay that group, hate that weary, weary heart, made up my mind that go and find a Who 
whisper in her ear, she really think I used to call her baby. She seemed like a baby to me. When she said that we should wed, you bet I was glad. Then I took her home and introduced her to Dad. A big mistake, that's when I lost my baby. For Dad was rich, you see, you see. She never did say ta-ta. Next day, she turned around and Mary popped. And just to think I used to call her baby. And now she's a mother to me, to me. For me, I'm going next to think she was my baby. It's got me up a tree. You see now when Peter has fallen in my little bed. Where did you get that routine from? They were on an amateur show. I was in uh, I think I was in Chicago mm -hmm. watching this annual police benefit show they had on the air and I saw them and I didn't think about them as entertainers I thought of them as a great stooge mm. and I put together here what I planned to do on the air and that's what I did never rehearsed it just shot it oh my gosh that <laughs> that's one of the greatest moments ever absolutely <laughs> Hilarious. The little guy I choked he was, he was wound up being a good friend. Really? Yeah. I a, love with that. a very bad back. Oh well, <laughs> that was funny. Do you remember Matty Stepanek? He was your MDA spokesman. You remember Matty? Oh God, beautiful yes. Matty. Yeah, he was a doll. Tell me about him. Your memories of him? I I blocked him out. I blocked him and every child that I saw die. I blocked them out. Because mm. if I think of them, I can't think of my work. If I think of them, I can't go on with my life. Mm. I was yeah, so involved mm -hmm. that, that it's me? not a memory to me. It's a part of my skin. Yeah. I try not to remember a lot mm -hmm. because I got such a good memory that I remember everything, mm -hmm. almost everything. And it's painful. I, it's not only painful, but I didn't make it. With all the work, it's still there. That bothers me. That muscular dystrophy is still attacking children. There's nothing I can do about it now. Mm. Nothing. Well, you devoted so much of your life to it, and they have made amazing Oh, we've made Progress. tremendous strides. We do some stuff now in research that's going to help so many children in the next three, four years. Mm -hmm. In 1976, Frank Sinatra walks out onto your MDA telethon and brings your partner with him. When I look at you in that moment, and I watched it a few times before this interview, you are ambushed by all kinds of emotions. You can see them all warring, and you, you, don't, you don't know what to say. What did you think, and what do you think now when you watch it? I thought to myself, dear God, give me something to say. Mm. And that was, he was at the wing, and then he came this way about 60 feet. Mm. I put my arms around him, he put his arms around me, and that was the first time in 20 years that we even spoke. And I now tell, tell an audience while I'm performing that the, the insanity of that mm. 20 years without talking was just beyond comprehension. How do you do that to someone you love so much? But you do that. It's like a divorce. There's nothing you can do about the emotions that it takes you through. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to not work with him anymore. That never entered it. Uh, but it was tough. It, you know, if I could ever talk about what both of us went through at the beginning of the break, 
it doesn't make for interesting reading or interesting listening to. Mm -hmm. So I don't go there. Mm -hmm. Do you, you didn't talk to him after that for 10 to 15 years till his son died and you picked up the phone. Why did it take more time after you all had come together? No, we, to we got together after the... You talked a little bit in between. Yeah, we spoke on the phone a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But when Dean's son was killed, I knew he needed me. Mm. And you were I there. needed I needed it. So I went to the funeral, of course. I didn't even see Dean, but Dean saw me. And it meant a great deal to him that I, I got there. It was the first time I ever saw my partner with a drained, shattered look. Yeah. I never saw him that way. Drained, mm -hmm. where you see the face is just a little drawn. Drawn, yeah. And the articulation went away. And I'm feeling two things, the sadness of his losing his son and my seeing what happened to him because of it. In 1983, Martin Scorsese casts you in his King of Comedy. Right. It was a very different role for Jerry Lewis. Mm -hmm. This Jerry Langford, which you named. Right. You named him Jerry. Why did you name him Jerry? Because whenever I walk in the streets of New York, you hear, hey, Jerry, from my pie, construction workers, cab drivers, bellmen, doormen, plain people. Hey, Jerry! If I walk 10 blocks, we hear at least 12 of them. Wow. So I said, Marty, you're destroying a chance of taking us in the street and letting that happen. Uh -huh. Let's change his name to Jerry. That's what we did. Hmm. Martin Scorsese said of you, what sets Lewis off is a combination of mastery and vulgarity. <laughs> do you agree with that? Yeah. You do? Sure. Why? Well, because vulgarity started with clowns. Mm. A different vulgarity, not a vulgarity as we know it. Yeah. But it started with clowns. Clowns in circuses would do anything to get a laugh, fall on their face, put custard in there, <laughs> Water, spill it, paper, dump. That was a clown's work. There's a vulgarity in comedy anyhow. Right. Because it disrupts an audience. It gets them mm -hmm. to move mm -hmm. the chairs. Mm -hmm. And once the laugh is there, they appreciate what you've done. In 1965, you're on the Andy Williams show. You took a bad fall. I still got the bump. Ugh. Your, your head and your spine. My which you spine chipped. and my back. And you live and, and with my this. Head. And you live with this every day up to now. 65 years. Was I, it the result of the Pratt fall? I did a fall from off the piano to wrap up the show, and I fell on a cannon plug. Oof. The crew knows what that is. A cannon plug is a steel connector from one wire to another. Wow. And I landed on it. And it just did a job on the base of my spine that I have had pain getting up for 65 years. Wow. They can't do anything to help me. They give me medicine. They give me uh, therapy. What I did was maybe one shot out of five billion falls. One shot. Mm. And I didn't see it there. Do you regret those Pratt Falls? No. No. You wouldn't take any of them back. Maybe that one. They built this house. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of others. Yeah, some yeah. others. I want to talk about something amazing that happened recently. You donated your negatives and your films to the Library of Congress. Right. Tell I me, just went there. I, uh, tell me about the Culpeper institution there, where all of this is now housed. I can't even begin to tell you. All I can tell you is you walk in, and it's 450,000 square feet. Let me say that again, 450,000 square feet. You can walk there until you got a beard. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to handle one of the oldest pieces of film. Who told you? Christmas the things before. that I know and learn, you would be surprised. I've heard least. about some of it already. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what was, that, what was it like? This is a piece of film that was held by Thomas Edison. 
that big a piece of film. A great train. A great train robbery, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Then I said to them, I don't suppose I sent you my screen taste. Oh yeah, we got it. Oh wow. Because I only know of one copy I had. Because I would never let anyone see it. Mm. And how I ever stayed in the movies, I don't know from that screen test. Mm -hmm. But That's, it's all there in the Library of Congress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you pleased that it's going to be preserved and yeah. extended? Yeah, oh, of course, of course. And I can go and get anything I want or need and get a copy. And everything's there? Yeah. The, the day the, cry, the clown cried? No. No, you have that one. You kept that back. We're not going to talk about that because I'm you tired can. of You can. Uh, everybody and their dog have talked about it. I personally think I would love to see it because of your artistry, but there's such expectations now built about what's in that canister. What was it you said about what I brought to it? The artistry that you have shown throughout your That's work. That's the problem. There was no artistry. No? No. And the work was bad. So you didn't want people to see it? The work wasn't even... As far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. my critique was it wasn't even something you should show to the public. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it turned out. Uh -huh. Now, my crew, my people, my staff, everyone involved couldn't believe that I was going to smother it, just mm. put it away. In Dean and Me, you relate being in an Italian restaurant in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Where I met Dean the one time I met him. Where he loves to go to eat. He loved to go there. And the, you see him come in the door, and you're right, it was shocking seeing him at that period. He was, the skin hung like a towel yeah. around his face. And you say in the book, God, don't get old. Don't get old. Well, how were you now dealing with being almost 90? I, the last of the Mohicans. Too. I think it's, I'm lucky. I'll say. Because I hear a lot of people don't make 90. Not even close. And not in this shape. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled making it, but I hate the dues. Mm. The dues of 90 is not something you want. Mm. The dues meaning this morning I got out of bed, it took me six minutes to get the one leg over the other to get onto the floor. Mm. I do that every day. Despite the dues of being 90, Lewis is still entertaining film roles and continues to perform for live audiences across the country. I go to Miami to see my uncle. He's playing chess with a friend of his. So I'm listening to them talking and my uncle said, I got so tired of memory loss, I got so tired of forgetting that I finally went to a specialist. And he gave me something, and I, I guess it's working. And his friend said, what is it? He said, it's, um, it's, um, uh, what's that long flower with the thorns on it? He said, Rose. He said, that's it, Rose. Rose, what's the name of the dead doctor gave to you? When, when I was watching your act, I took my 16-year-old and my 12-year-old to your act, and they howled and screamed. And it was a young crowd in Washington, I have to tell you. Where I, did I play in Washington? You played the Lincoln, Lincoln Theater, Theater, I think. Lincoln Theater. You told a story about going to China recently. Well, they took me to the Great Wall. Oh. And I was with probably 200 press. Yeah. Followed me all over Shanghai and all over China. Mm -hmm. But at the Great Wall, I'm standing there with a reporter from United Press. Mm -hmm. And he said, well... What do you think of the Great Wall? I said, I think it's nice, but it ain't great. <laughs> it made the front pages of every paper in Asia. Jerry Lewis calls the Great Wall nice. <laughs> and I said, how do you say nice in China? Tong Yao. <laughs> Tong Yao is nice. No, not so nice. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Tong Yao. Well, you never know that they have a special way of naming Chinese children. Oh. It's a special way. They take a huge silver platter. Mm -hmm. They put it on the ground. They grab a handful of silverware. They throw the silverware up in the air. And as the silverware hits the platter, ping tong, ching, shang, ha tong, ching, is how they name Chinese children. Now, you know, when some people hear a joke like that, they say, well, that's politically incorrect. You shouldn't be telling that oh, joke. Bull 
What do you say? I got Besides six. Me. I got six Catholic jokes that'll that'll stop <laughs> their services. <laughs> you can't tell them now. No, of course not. <laughs> but you can tell me when we're finished. So these two Jews? No. <laughs> That's what I like to see, Jerry. And that's not easy when you're a Jew. I know, I know, but that's good. It's good practice. Um, tell me, who do you consider funny today? I'm going to give you some names. Robin Williams. Well, he's gone. But he, he what he did talent. is not gone. Great talent. Billy Crystal. Oh, hilarious. I mean... Jimmy Fallon. He's, he's a beginner. Mm -hmm. He's got a long way to go, but he's doing well. He's doing well. The fact that he's doing the third show makes it well. Mm. Jimmy Fallon could never, ever be like the old comics that we remember. Mm -hmm. He could never do what I do because he had too many years on Saturday Night Live, which was a series of this is what you will do, uh -huh. and that's what we're shooting next. No point of view, no contrib contribution. They just did what was on the credit, on the cue card. Mm -hmm. And I think Jimmy is suffering from that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And watch him in about a year. You're going to see a development of this kid that's going to be so wonderful. What about Stephen Colbert? I don't like him. Why not? I think he's a snob. Oh. I think he's elitist and snob. Hmm. Tina Fey. Ah, oh, wonderful. Really? Brilliant, brilliant. Everything comes from her brain. Huh. Marvelous. I want to talk about some quick contemporary events. You are beloved in France. Don't forget it. The French Legion of Honor. <laughs> and the commander of arts and letters. You are adored there. I mean, when you show up at Cannes or say, it's, forget Angelina Jolie or anybody else, it's Jerry Lewis everybody wants to see. Pretty much. When you watched, <laughs> and humble too, when you watched, <laughs> When you watch what's happened, this isn't funny, what's been happening on CNN and on Fox, ISIS blowing up, shooting people indiscriminately, what went through your mind as you saw this? You've got to remember something, that ISIS has attacked the world, right. okay? And we've got, all of a sudden, I'm wondering, where are all of our NATO allies. Why don't I have Germany and Italy and Great Britain? Why don't I have all of them, including Spain, yeah. doing something? Get all of your military together, bring that military to our military, and wipe them out. They're asking to be stopped, and we're not stopping, and we're just reporting what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. And what do you think about the refugees? Allowing refugees, these refugees should stay where the hell they are. They say there's a humanitarian crisis. They're fleeing. They have to come to America. Hey, nobody has worked Europe. harder for the human condition than I have. But they're not part of the human condition. If 11 guys in that group of 10,000 are ISIS, how can I take the chance? Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose another Frenchman or another Englishman. Mm -hmm. That bothers me. You can't really knock the president per se because he was never given to understand that's out there. He was never ready. He was never prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And what I'm watching in him is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And you don't have uncertainty in a leader. A leader doesn't give a sh what he does, but he gets it done. Politics. I know you watch it. I see you watching news every every minute of the day. Yeah. What do you think of Donald Trump? I think he's great. Why? Because he's a showman. Mm. And we've never had a showman in the president's chair. Well, you had Ronald Reagan. He was a bit of a showman. Well, that's different. Uh -huh. that, that was, you can't make a comparison with Ronald Reagan, because mm -hmm. I can do three hours on him with just praise. He was so good. All right, final question. What is the legacy of Jerry Lewis? The legacy? The legacy of Jerry Lewis. My son. That's the greatest legacy that I've left this world. That son, I had a bunch of them, but that son is part of my legacy. Because mm -hmm. he'll tell anyone anything they want to know. He can tell them the date, 
that it happened. Mm -hmm. He can tell them with whom I was at the time. And he's the greatest audience I've ever had. From the day he was born, he was a baby, but he still looked at me and went, ha, ha, ha. This is the final question. Aren't you glad? Why is it over? Well, we can keep going. Hey, I'm here all night. I could, do, I could take you to dinner. We can continue this, which I'd like, actually. Yeah, I'd probably have to pay. No, 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 I'll pay. If I can take you to dinner, I'll pay. All right, you pay me for the interview. Oh, well, that's a different story. I don't pay for interviews, but I do pay for dinner. Okay, this is a good time to bring up this question. This is something I know near and dear to your heart. Laughter as healing. Oh, God, and yes. And how laughter can actually heal relationships, people. Tell me about this. You've spoken a lot about this at universities, before business groups. Everywhere in the world. What is it about laughter that heals? How does it heal? Well, I think you have to ask the man or the woman that laughs openly at things that may not be funny to us. Mm. But the people that laugh at things that get to them is magic because mm. they didn't know it was coming. And not being a professional, they're not going to know the joke that's coming. Mm -hmm. So that however laughter comes to them, it's a fresh, it's almost a refreshing cool water on your warm body. Mm -hmm. A woman came up to me at the hotel. I was playing here at the Desert Inn. I did a great show, two and a half hours, and I was really on. Wow. The show was over, and security tells me there's a lady outside that's crying, but bitterly, like a child. Huh. She has to see you. Let her in. She comes in. She says, can I hug you? I said, of course, I'll hug you back. But if we hug hard, we'll go to the room. <laughs> so she says to me, Mr. Lewis, I want to thank you for tonight's performance. I said, thank you. She said, I haven't laughed in seven years. My son was killed in Saigon. And I haven't gotten over it until tonight. And because of what you did for me out there, I understand that I've lost my son and mm -hmm. I'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. Wow. If you start to get a little loose, that'll make you pay attention. And isn't that the real importance of what you do? Sure. And Absolutely. what you've always done. Absolutely. While we're making money and while we're entertaining the public per se, there'll always be a half a dozen people in there that needed us more than the whole audience. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I never forget that they're there. They're always there. Yeah. People uh, that will break your heart if you hear what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And when you, gen when you generalize that, it's a huge plateau, a beautiful portrait of people in need. Mm -hmm. And that gets my attention. I'll say. I'm going to tell. As I close out, I'm going to tell a little secret on my producer here, Chris. When he walked into the room, he just said hello to you, and he came out. And he said, look, I've got tears in my eyes. I said, what's wrong? He said, when I walked in, I don't know. It was just being in front of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> but you know what? It's just what you're talking about. He's responding to all the memories of the laughs and the joy that you've given him and all of us all these years. And I'm delighted to have been with you for a little bit. I think you're about the best interviewer I've ever had. Oh, come on. Now you're going to make me blush. I've had a few, starting back with Tynan in London. Oh, wow. Kenneth and, Tynan. And Robert Benioun in Paris. And, and Olaf Newton in Sweden. I've had some heavy-duty people. I'll say. You're the best interviewer. And I've had thousands of them in my life. And you're the best. Well, you are articulate. You know what you're going to talk about. You're interested in the answer. That's the key. Yeah. You're interested in everything you ask me to see what the answer is. And that draws from me eager to do more for you. Well, you are awesome. And I'm so, it's an honor. Thank it's you. It's been one of the highlights of my career. Well, you got to really? promise me something. Anything. I get a copy. You'll get two copies. I can give you five. We can market this. I'm just upset I didn't get one. Hey, lady, 
We'll do that next time. It was a supreme honor for me. I need to thank Jerry's son, Chris Lewis, for helping to facilitate the interview, as well as Sandra Schaefer, Sam Lewis, and of course, the man himself, Jerry Lewis. It was a complete pleasure. Well, that's all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Let me know what you thought of tonight's show. And don't miss our next program, The World Over Christmas Special 2015, featuring new music from Delphio and Ellis Marcellus, the St. Paul's Boys Choir, and some Christmas favorites. Tis the season. Don't we need a lift at this point? The show airs. An hour later on Christmas Eve at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. So an hour later than our normal airtime. Don't miss it. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time. Bye now.